Hello, everyone. Thanks for giving us your time today. I'm Ian Hamilton in New York, joined by David Heaney from London Broadcasting for us today. It is April 2nd. No? Is it April 2nd? No. What is the date today? That's My notes aren't right. April 9th. I had to refresh them. April 9th. And I'm wearing a Quest 3. We're live on YouTube with audience interaction and on replay across every podcast platform. We're here to talk about the rise of virtual reality, and you can support our work directly with membership at UploadVR.com. David, what do we have today? That's interesting that you had to refresh your notes. Has your headset just been in here since last week? Did you put it on and you were straight in here? No, I. so what the way I did it was I came in here to check it. Then I realized I didn't have my notes. I went outside, made the notes, came back, and obviously did not hit your refresh button here. So. Ah, okay, that, that makes more sense. Um, yeah, so we don't have a huge show today. There's not the groundbreaking topics we had last week, but there's still a few things we want to discuss, and we'll try to go pretty deep and pretty wide as well. So we'll first talk about Magic Leap 2, which just got a spectator smartphone app, a really interesting concept that we hope comes to other headsets. And uh, Magic Leap has switched over to OpenXR, so that's going to really help developers of AR apps. We'll then talk about the Beat Saber Hip Hop mixtape, which just dropped and is why we're about five minutes late today. We had to get that news out. And the reason we're going to talk about that, even though we don't normally talk about games, is that it features explicit lyrics for the first time. And that may indicate uh, some of the direction that Meta wants to go with their content, being a little less safe than they were beforehand. We'll then talk about the Quest V64 update, which is starting to roll out now, that's focused on Quest 3. The flagship feature is that it improves the pass-through quality on Quest 3. We'll talk about exactly what's been improved and the interesting trade-off that's been made to make that improvement. It also adds external microphone support, which could allow me to use Quest 3 in this studio. We plan to test that very soon. We'll talk more about why Quest 3's built-in microphone isn't good enough later when we talk about this feature and it also brings lying down mode you'll remember that that was brought for quest 2 and pro and v63 so it's now on quest 3 as well finally we'll finish off with a discussion on the growth of pc vr on steam and if you haven't read my article on that uh, please go to uploadvr.com and read it if possible I'm seeing people talk about some kind of Kickstarter out there that I have not seen uh, talking about pinball, but uh, I appreciate the the interesting ideas there, right? Uh, pinball is just one example of content that could be emulated in VR in incredibly uh, immersive ways if you just get a controller, right? If you just get the buttons on either side of a cardboard box, basically, or a wooden block. You can set that up on a stand and have a one-to-one -one pinball experience pretty effectively. But I don't know that I would kickstart anything like that. I would. This, this seems like an idea that you would homebrew and then find a compatible bunch of games to make work. But I know that's a very exciting time. That's just one example of, of things being reborn in VR. And I am, I am noticing a trend these last few weeks. Are you feeling that at all, David, seeing this trend of emulators uh, sort of speeding up in this space? Yeah, we'll have to look at this specific Kickstarter to give our, our real takes on it. But definitely with Apple Vision Pro out now, we're seeing a lot of the experimentation that we saw back in the early days of the modern consumer VR industry uh, coming into you know mixed reality and in bringing 2D apps into spatial computing or AR or VR, whatever you want to call it, in an interesting way. Just a small note, you may hear it in my voice that I'm just recovering from an illness. I was out from uh, Wednesday to Sunday. I was completely wiped out. So sometimes I'll have to mute my microphone to cough here. So if I stop speaking, that's why I haven't accidentally muted myself. Yeah, everyone missing missing your words on the website. And I know you were missing uh, giving them. Uh, so I hope you're feeling better, David, because uh, there's a lot of people that are Looking forward to hearing what you have to say uh, here and on our website. So uh, thank you for getting back to it. And thank you for everyone tuning in this week. It is a slower news week. It's a smaller list of news, but it's also just uh, big times. Uh, this has been a nonstop week after week build up towards this next phase of personal computing. And it seems like Apple is firing on all cylinders with devs releasing all this content in uh 
very odd ways, right? Like there's no there's no media blitz with all this stuff that's hitting the Apple Vision Pro and it's not going to have a major impact because there's not millions of customers yet. But there is kind of an onslaught of a lot of things hitting test flight. And then Meta is building up uh, for its big, big, big launch very, very soon. So let's talk about this first subject, David, Magic Leap 2. Yeah, let's talk about this because this is a really interesting idea. This is a kind of generic spectator app. This is something you can download on iPhone right now, and they say they're going to bring it to Android pretty soon. And if Magic Leap 2 developers implement this in their Magic Leap 2 apps um, through you know updating to the latest SDK and enabling support, the headset will essentially render a third view. Obviously, there's one view for each eye that will render a third view from the perspective of the smartphone, stream it over to this app, and then you will see uh, the person with the headset on and the virtual objects that they're seeing in the same place. Now, the caveat here is this is not automatic, the alignment that you both have to look at a marker, but that can be a QR code or April tag or any of the kind of popular markers. So the headset and the phone look at this marker, this all aligns and you see what they're seeing. Obviously, as you can see, there's also recording built in. This is something um, I think a lot of people have asked for, for Vision Pro. It would be I wonder if we'll see a WWDC in June. Apple released this feature for iPhone so that people in the room can, if you want, see what you're seeing in Vision Pro. Kyle is suggesting in the comments that Stevie might not be showing an image on that TV. So if you're not seeing that image, it's uh, basically an image showing the spectator mode of Magic Leap 2. Um, but uh, yeah, just a fairly simple, straightforward Yeah, let's image. see if I can get this... Uh... This cassette, you can talk for a while. I'll see if I can fix this. Yeah, so this is a big deal. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about as I was walking around New York, and uh, this kind of a joke uh, I've got going now, uh, when you walk around New York or you come out of the subway stations, you can't orient yourself faster than your phone or your phone can't orient itself faster than you in most situations because the GPS is bouncing off the walls and can't get a, a good fix on where you're located. And one of the things I noticed was that uh, one of the train stations here had a QR code. Uh, they've installed some kind of QR code system based uh, right inside the subway station. And I've been wondering whether that's what's going to be necessary for visual positioning systems to match lining you up as quickly as you can when you emerge from the subway station to know where your next destination is. It's a huge problem. Uh, it's like one of the most challenging things for these positioning systems. And then there's this Magic Leap uh, system that requires manual calibration of, of linking up two devices or uh, two completely different devices into the same location. Once you set that up, it's an amazing, amazing thing. But it's a huge pain uh, if you don't have that uh, that system. Like uh, on Vision Pro, uh, this is kind of automatic, right? Getting uh, you synced up, your coordinate space synced up with another user. What, like, do you know what the setup time is to get this hooked up for Magic Leap? Yeah, I'm just back now, so I didn't hear everything you said, but I think I, I get the gist of what you're asking. Yeah, it's it's a quick setup. It's just that you have to have those tags pr printed out, right? Or realistically, remember that the Magic Leap 2 is an enterprise headset, and in many cases, they're going to have you know easy access to a printer. A lot of these companies are already using QR codes or April tags, and it's not like you have to have a special one. It's just as long as the headset and the, the phone are looking at the same one. Um, the interesting thing about Vision OS is that it's kind of architected very well to make stuff like this theoretically conceivably possible without even having to stream a third view because that's obviously quite computationally expensive. Theoretically, over time, it's possible that Apple could build some kind of uh, Vision OS mini runtime into the iPhone that actually takes the per window views and updates them at a lower rate and then the iPhone kind of composites them in 3D. It's, it's hard to know exactly how they'll do this. The Magic Leap um, 2 has a computational advantage over some of the other standalone headsets uh, here. It has, I think, the same or a very similar chipset to what was put into the Steam Deck. And actually a fun uh, fact that I don't think a lot of people know, the chipset in the Steam Deck is a variant of what was developed for Magic Leap 2. Magic Leap actually went to AMD to get this chip built and Valve is, is built on that same architecture, uh, slightly verified. So that's an irrelevant tangent. The, the point is that Magic Leap 2 does have the, the computational overhead to make something like this practical in pretty much any application. 
Yeah, I don't know how much more there is to talk about Magic Leap 2 right at the moment. I noticed that uh, the wall that Saudi Arabia is uh, trying to build in their country has been scaled back. And uh, yeah, that's a tangent, but that is the owner of Magic Leap 2, uh, the, the nation of, of Saudi Arabia or the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, yeah, they've, they're building a wall there in that country, and they just had to scale that back. Uh, I, uh, I've wondered how Saudi Arabia is going to use Magic Leap 2 over the long term. That's, that's why I bring that up. Yeah, it stands as a very interesting headset. We're obviously now in the era where all of the big tech companies uh, that have entered the space have doubled down on camera pass-through with the Apple Vision Pro, with the Quest 3. Uh, from what we know, the Samsung Google headset will also be a VR-style headset with camera pass-through, while Magic Leap stands pretty much alone with truly transparent optics. Microsoft obviously did have HoloLens 2. It still does have HoloLens 2. It's just it hasn't been um, updated since 2019 from a hardware perspective. Um, but Magic Leap 2 kind of uh, jumped over HoloLens 2. It is interesting that it's still there. There are some niche applications in which, uh, the from a safety perspective, they're not going to currently accept pass-through headsets. You also do get this higher legibility of the real world. You're still in Apple Vision Pro looking at the world through six megapixel cameras. We know that to get to, to human vision, you need like 20 megapixels or more. So their view of the real world will be better in certain circumstances in a headset like this. Um, so it's interesting to see that they still have carved out this industrial enterprise niche use case. And uh, I, I wonder if we ever will see Magic Leap come back to its original vision of consumer because we've heard them talk about a few times, oh yeah, so right now we're going for enterprise because that's where this technology makes sense right now, but we still do have that long-term ambition of consumer. It would be interesting to see, is this going to be one of the companies that tries to bring transparent optics to the consumer market before the big tech companies? Yeah, the consumer market being incredibly hard to crack, right? You've got a you've got such crazy amounts of weight loss that you've got to apply to your devices. However, what's interesting is Magic Loop has some of the architecture set up right if they really wanted to make that that leap. Uh, so the wired battery pack to your pocket or processor pack could be a major advantage in getting there first if Magic Loop really wanted to do it. But it's just, it's still such a huge expense, such like a, a risky thing to pick any year to try to enter AR as a consumer market. Yeah, I'm seeing Kyle in our comments, uh, obviously our operations manager saying, what about X-Real when I said that, that Magic Leap kind of stands alone? The, the difference, X, most of X-Real glasses, the majority of them are just kind of dumb glasses in the sense that they take an existing device like your your phone or your tablet or your Nintendo Switch and project it onto a fixed display in front of you. The, this being a kind of comp computational platform with you know a, a tethered processing unit means that from a developer perspective, it's a bit different. Obviously, uh, the new X-Rail Air Ultra is a, a development platform. It does have cameras for positional tracking. It does have, they claim, room meshing, uh, but it's still not on the device itself. It's coming from a Samsung Galaxy S phone that is running the actual content. They do say that they are going to come up with their own compute unit at some point, but they said that in the past about uh, the X-Real Lite, then the N-Real Lite, and that didn't come to pass. Maybe it does happen this time, but for now, I mean, Magic Leap stands alone in, in providing something that a company can go, I want to build an application for this and just buy the headset and run that application, not having to kind of also piggyback off a smartphone. Yeah, I'm wondering, we've, we've talked about it a little bit, and I it is, a, it is another relevant tangent. I appreciate our audience noticing your uh, terminology there. It's a very useful one. The, the relevant tangent I'll bring up here is this idea we've talked about in the past of zooming in with your pass-through. So this idea that maybe your headset can see uh, further away using uh, telephoto zoom or using sensors that are just gathering that much data. And you could just kind of like go like this and zoom in on something pretty far away. It's, it's interesting to think of that analogy as like AR glasses like this could let you see things up close in perfect resolution in, in exactly what your eyes see. Whereas VR headsets quite literally will let you see things further away 
in higher clarity. Uh, and I, I just, when we start getting that functionality of being able to zoom in, what does that do to the overall um, pitch of these devices? Yeah, and you can imagine a lot more uh, augmentation than, than just that of all kinds of ways that if you are in a VR style headset with pass through, the, the classic term is, you know, full control over pixels. You can pretty much change the environment in a helpful and useful way. I, I still would like to do, add a wee bit of realism here to say that we're still not even in the line of sight of getting standalone headsets that can even match human vision, never mind exceed. We're still like very far off in some key ways. I think there's going to be great progress here. I expect, you know, currently we've got the, the, the $500 headset with four megapixel cameras and $3,500 headset with six megapixel cameras. That's mostly a limitation of compute. It's not that they couldn't stick on higher resolution cameras. It's about how do you process that imagery uh, at once. You know, the, the main point of the R1 chipset in the Vision Pro is just the fact that the, the regular chipsets can't ha process that much bandwidth. They don't have the memory bandwidth to take in all of the sensors at the same time, as well as process uh, these six megapixel dual cameras in in real time. So it's actually going to be the the R2 and the R3 and the future chips that that enable Vision Pro to push forward. And obviously on a on a PC with something like Vario, you can just overcome that with brute, brute computational force. It's a it's an interesting idea, but I just think for now, let's let's get the human vision first before we think about exceeding it. Jack B's comment here: pleasing the retail cuts consumer market is fickle and subject to the media. Military contracts have no such bugaboos and are stable, con guaranteed contract money, hence Microsoft hologlens for soldiers. And that is ultimately the argument that, that kind of got out there into public with Microsoft, what scolding their employees saying, uh, we, we do work for the military and we work for a military we choose. And that flies in the face with what a lot of those creators uh, really wanted to do with their technology. So it's it's not going to go away anytime soon, this idea that uh, human vision enhancement is going to have massive, massive military and police uh, uses over the long term. What do you what did you just pull up here, David? Oh, it was just for background. This is just the the optics stack on Magic Leap 2. There really is a lot of complexity they have going here to get their uh, segmented dimming. They are they are inarguably the market leader when it comes to transparent AR optics. Um, it's it's interesting that there was a report from I think it was the Financial Times around six months ago that Meta was looking into buying some of the IP, the intellectual property, presumably patents and uh, potentially even engineering design work from magic leap potentially for their ar glasses and it's yeah uh, we have a big fan i think of magic leap in the comments here james o'loughlin who's constantly pointing out that um you know they say for example that they develop for magic leap and that they swear that it gives true line of sight for true ar glasses for consumers as in they try this and they they see this and they think you know this is so good that i can see the path um I think the problem is that to get there, Magic Leap 2 is, is using some very, very expensive components and techniques. And that's why this is a, a $3,200 headset. It's why they have taken that strategy that they currently do. It's not just that enterprise is simpler. It's that enterprise doesn't have a problem paying $3,200. Now, some of the commenters will obviously point out, you know, we're saying this while simultaneously we're praising the $3,500 Apple Vision Pro as a consumer device. And I think it's just about utility. You know, it's about not just from a content and software perspective, but about the fact that, you know, consumers expect more than the field of view of transparent AR headsets. That's the biggest reason that, you know, they just aren't appealing right now is that the, the field of view of content is just so narrow. Um, I'll try and see if I can bring up the classic field of view chart, which is that we always like to show on this show. I heard an interesting comment today that I haven't seen myself, but I heard someone you heard of someone using an X Real uh, glasses with Steam Deck, and the X Real providing a virtual display, like a 3DS like display, uh, hovering above the touchscreen on the bottom. It's a really, really interesting combination to think about having a physical display in your hand and then a secondary virtual display right above it. And I, I love that idea for for these see-through AR optics over the long term. But 
I don't know how it's going to feel in practice to do that sort of thing when you're dealing with this kind of limited field of view. Yeah, that is an interesting use case, I guess, with the current axial glasses, it's not going to be anchored there because they're, you know, they're three off in certain situations. If you have like a beam adapter that you attach to it, or if you're on a PC, but mostly it's like zeroed off as in it's just fixed to your vision as in whether you rotate or move, it is just like a HUD. And, you know, I'm making far too big a screen given the field of view. It's, it's more like, more like this. It's a, it's a very small postage stamp. This is the, the classic thing we like to point out. Um, but as James Lachlan is pointing out, the view of the real world that you get is like much, much better because it's a transparent optic. Yes, there is some dimming from the way these optics work, but the, the clarity that you're going to get, and we'll talk about this pass through quite soon when we, we move on to our third topic and talk about Quest 3s, but is a lot better. The problem is that the virtual content is just limited to this small rectangle. Now, Magic Leap 2, as I keep saying, is the market leader. What they've done here is given a taller field of view than any transparent optic. Pretty much everything else is around the same size as X-Rail Air 2 Ultra here, right? Your HoloLens, um, Magic Leap 1, they're all pretty much this white box here. With Magic Leap 2, what they've done is deliver the tallest field of view in transparent AR and no one else has come close yet. There's no other product that has actually launched onto the market that has done what Magic Leap has done. But you look at the, the Quest 3 here and you see there's just a much, much wider field of view. And then we look at the human eye and think that even VR headsets aren't good enough. One of the things I always criticize about the current state of VR is that not enough has been done for field of view. Field of view has effectively stagnated for 10 years. Yes, it's gone up maybe by five or 10 degrees, but look at the vast emptiness in the peripheral here. We, we The eventual headsets we want, we want the full human field of view, or at the very least you want like 150, 180 degrees so you get that feeling. It's the most missing thing. And it'll be an interesting thing to see by the time that transparent optics get to what we have in VR today, where might VR style optics be? Aaron Davis out there watching us from Japan. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, we love seeing where our audience is watching us from. If you're in VR, let us know what app you're using uh, to watch us in. And yes, to those people that want to watch us in VR, we are still trying to get there. Uh, but let's move on to our next subject, uh, this, this Beat Saber music pack that we just got up. So hip-hop mixtape featuring some explicit lyrics for the first time, right, David? Why don't you talk about this feature a little bit? Yeah, um, we're having trouble with the image again there. We'll, we'll get that sorted for next week. Um, for now, I'll just describe what it is here. We normally don't talk about games, as I said at the start, but this is the first Beat Saber DLC to include explicit lyrics. And I played Beat Saber before and been really put off by the censorship, right? You know. I presume most people here watching are adults. I'm an adult. If I want to hear a song that I know well, I want to hear it in the way that I would normally hear it if I'm playing it on Spotify. I don't want that jarring kind of loss of what the uh, songwriter intended. And so what Beat Saber has done to support this is recently added an explicit lyrics toggle. And it's actually on by default unless your meta account is younger than 13. So if you are a um a preteen and we talked before a few months ago on this show about meta introducing that new category of accounts to allow 10 11 and 12 year olds to, to use the quest if you're one of those accounts this will be forced on as in the censorship will be forced on if you're not though you'll get the explicit lyrics and this is a huge track list in terms of the artist it brings you've got tupac Nicki minaj snoop dogg eminem outcast the notorious big dr dre pop smoke uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. They, these are the, some of the biggest names in hip hop. And it would just have been um, almost comically jarring to release some of these tracks with censorship, given the nature of these tracks. No, it's, it's, it's almost like I, I, if I was the artist, I would say no, right, to the, to the idea of my music coming into VR without those, those key parts of the songs uh, that, that everyone expects. Um, I, I don't know if there's a whole lot to talk about here, uh, on, on the tangents we might go off on, but I do think we are, we're in for kind of, a a transitional year when it's, 
it's it's really bizarre that kind of like meta is making such a push to get kids as young as 10 into their headsets meanwhile apple is is sh steering you know sh steering its ship straight for the professionals at $3500 so they they went for like the the most extreme use case imaginable uh trying to go after the pro users with their headset while meta is basically trying to stuff everyone they possibly can into Horizon Worlds and Rec Room and places like that uh, where it's it's free and, and uh, lots of different games uh, available to play. And then, of course, Beat Saber is this thing that's kind of, it's not in the middle, but you have to pay for it. Uh, you've got a demo on there that you can try for free, I think, still. But it's obviously the game that most people are going to pick up instantaneously. It's the very first game that a lot of people are going to get when they get their headset. And I don't know. It's just, it's one of these, over the course of the year, what's it going to, you know, how's it going to feel to realize that Meta is trying to get so many children into these headsets when professionals are also getting into a completely different headset at the exact same time? Yeah, I mean, it's it's they have to kind of play a balance here. They have to appeal to both markets. They have to think of where is their investment. Obviously, we saw last year Roblox come to the platform. Um, there's a focus. Rec Room has always been huge for kids, as anyone who's ever played it knows. As much as Rec Room has tried over time with their junior accounts, etc., you still constantly will just see that full of children. Um, but you know, at the same time. As you say, they do want Quest to be more than just a gaming platform. We saw that push with Quest Pro, although it spectacularly failed. Um, where we talked last week about how there is a Horizon Workrooms update coming to make that a lot easier to use. I think once Meta can get their Kodak avatars out there, this becomes something that, from a social perspective, is more appealing to adults. You know, these cartoony adult or these cartoony uh, avatars that we're using right now are not exactly appealing for a boardroom meeting. And I think we'll probably see the next push for serious productivity when they come up with the next headset designed around serious productivity, which is presumably Quest Pro 2 or whatever the LG headset ends up being called. Yeah, I think uh, if you haven't seen the Amaze VR content, uh, it's quite quite impressive the way they've captured those artists in Amaze VR and uh, I think that's both on Apple Vision Pro and on MetaQuest. Uh, might even be on Steam. I can't remember if Amaze VR is on Steam. But I would recommend most people out there looking for what immersive music can look like would go check out that app because it's pretty impressive. Were you ready to talk about Quest V64 here, David? Or is there anything else you want to talk about here with Beat Saber? Yeah, there's a few comments I want to bring up. Firstly, Jack B's comment is very funny. Um, wet ass pass through. That's uh, their comment on Nicki Minaj being in this mixtape. Uh, James O'Loughlin uh, pointing out something we've seen a lot of people ask about, which is uh, the prospect of us doing an episode of VR Download in Vision Pro with spatial personas. And it's something I would really love to do. And I'm not in any way against. The difficulty there is that we would have to do it from a first person perspective. So we would have to find a way to switch cameras between you know my view of Ian and Ian's view of me. The the obvious potential solution there is is a third person spectator camera, but that would, as far as we know, require a third Vision Pro, which is a massive expenditure for uh, thirty five hundred dollars. We're we plan to investigate whether it's possible to use the Vision OS simulator on Mac to act as that third perspective. But right mm -hmm. now, that does not seem to be possible. The simulator does not seem to be able to make active FaceTime calls but it's something we would love to do we're for, actively investigating the idea of it for my own curiosity david what what does it require what would it take other than your time obviously to get this studio running on a vision pro um well we would have to get the um there would be a cost involved i think i've gone through that with you before the the, the cost the, the involved. developer you know like the, the developer yeah. account and the unity license right Yes, exactly. Yeah, we, we would have to have that have that payment. It's more of a financial issue there at, at that point. But I mean, you lose a lot of the advantages when you when you get to that. If you're in a fully immersive app like this, you can't use eye tracking. So you actually get a render resolution that is pretty much the same as Quest 3, right? You don't 
you don't get any of the real advantages of Vision Pro and you obviously get worse hand tracking. And it's not clear to me that other than maybe the microphone quality and, and OLED displays, that it would actually be a meaningful, better experience. You know, you, as I said before, like the magic in Vision Pro is in many ways the software. It's it, the, the what Vision OS can do, what can be done on the platform level with spatial personas, etc. Not particularly, it is a headset with an existing apps. You know, I don't know if like if you're playing um, Fruit Ninja on Vision Pro, do you think that's like, like a meaningfully better experience than had you been playing the same game on a Quest Three? I mean, no, it's the reverse, right? Like the the hand tracking there is yeah, going but to be suppose for the work. sake of argument that um Quest three used hand tracking for its fruit ninja as well. And suppose for the sake of argument Quest three had the same thirty hertz update rate. Do you think the headset of Vision Pro would make any meaningful improvement when you're in an yeah, app like no, that? I, I get where you're going. No. Um except in cases where I want spectators or FaceTime in, in, involved in the equation sure. in some way. So to answer, like, so to, well, to recap I mean. for you, David, and for our audience, so I've been messing with this myself. And what I had, what I've done is I've set up a second Apple ID for myself. I set it uh, as a member of my family. So it gets access to all of my purchases. I set up the Vision Pro with that new Apple ID. So it's a completely fresh install of of that system there's nothing else running on it and then i've got a mac mini with an m2 processor in it that can log into either of my apple ids and all i have to really do is add a second caller add the other apple id to the call and that's providing uh the third person view but to david's point we can't recreate this kind of like camera switching setup it would all be from my perspective shared out to the mac and i would do that via screen sharing and it's we're trying it would be a different show it'd be a fundamentally different presentation of material to our audience and i'm i'm trying to figure it out because i think there's huge value in doing some of this stuff over in vision pro and comparing contrasting the differences with our audience but it's, yeah, sure. it's a matter of figuring out what is the right way to do it but it's i, I spent some time yesterday david with vr chat over here running as a window uh from my steam link you know running as a steam link window over here and then i had rec room right here and it was really I, I just sat there for a while because i had lobbies just regular lobbies open in each room and it's just people screaming in either space at each other there's there's a lot of yelling uh and children running around with the weirdest avatars imaginable and it's like i'm i'm looking into the metaverse from apple's universe and it's pretty calm and serene in here, right? Like I'm I'm in the desert looking at these two windows where it's just absolute pandemonium happening inside those windows. And it's it is complete a completely different universe. Yeah, I mean, as I said in my review, and I stand by the, the strength of Vision Pro is that it turns screens into software, right? You're you're not doing anything that someone couldn't do with two monitors, right? You could have theoretically rec room on one monitor and VR chat on the other. But the difference here is that you don't need hardware for this. You're now in a portable sense, you now have the same thing as someone with a multi-monitor setup. You, that that expensive and impractical hardware has become software and that's what Vision Pro can do. Well, all right, so here's here's another, here's an example. Um, the Apple Music app is uh, installed on all the Vision Pros. You, you hang the Apple Music app over here, so it's floating right here in front of you. You have another persona sitting right next to you, and then you hit the lyrics button on the song, and you have effectively the perfect uh, karaoke setup. You have a person right there next to you who looks like the person you know in the real world. You've got shared music playing in sync with each other, and you've got the lyrics uh, streaming up from the bottom of the screen as they go. I don't think we're too far off from people doing karaoke nights uh, in Vision Pro. The reason we're not seeing it yet is the people who are buying Vision Pro are all $3,500 buying professionals who don't necessarily go out to karaoke nights every other weekend and don't have friends who also are those karaoke friends.
Yeah, the the fact that you get share play with music like that, it's remarkable. The, the way that, as we talked about last week, the way that Vision OS is architected to allow for this kind of social context, to allow you to kind of just hang out with people without having to go to a specific app and bring in all of this existing content as if you're in the same room together is, is incredible. And it really is, a, the only point I was making is that, you know, as a headset, as a piece of hardware detached from this amazing software, Vision Pro isn't anything special the, the the specialness as i I've keep saying is just in that vision os experience and that's why to come back to the original point that's why i'm just saying if we we're in this studio for example i don't really see what the massive difference right now would be between me sitting here in this app this specific app in a vision pro and a quest 3 you know given the, the amount of effort for that but the magic comes in can we figure out some way to you know get a a vision os simulator on a mac being a, a camera for two spatial personas with a screen behind us showing kind of this and, and, you know, the ability to have comments and things like that. That's something we're, we definitely, definitely love to do. There's some interesting comments here talking about the culture of VR chat and, and people suggesting it has a culture problem. And I, I think it's so difficult to talk about that. There's a lot of discussion about a third place. Uh, people are known for having home or work, you know, adults have home or work, uh, kids have home or school. And what's missing for both adults and for kids is a third place where you socialize with others. So uh, for adults, you go out for drinks, uh, you go out to clubs, uh, you, you check out a comedy club, you go to a game night somewhere, maybe a trivia night. Uh, kids would have uh, daycare. Uh, well, I mean, a couple generations ago, it was go play in the street with the kids in the neighborhood and get you know, disappear. And there's just a ton of discussion about how our society and societies in general have lost that with the internet. And when I, when you've got rec room floating up there in one window and you've got VR chat floating in the other window and you're seeing people acting like they do on the playground, it, it's so crystal clear that that is the hole that those places are filling, but it's, it's not the same, right? It's not the same as, a kid whose parent you might have to answer to if you slap that kid in the face, right? Like, like if you get in a fight on the playground, you're going to have to deal with some parents uh, very soon. That's, that's not true necessarily in rec room or VR chat. And that's, I mean, that's the problem of the whole situation, right? Like I saw in our comments, someone saying they actually witnessed a moderator kick someone out of horizon world for being underage. That's, that's something we've wondered about is what, how active are these platforms in booting people out of their, their places that really don't belong. Yeah, for sure. Um, it'll be interesting to see how long it takes Rec Room to come to Vision Pro properly, not just the iPad app, but you know, they, they were one of the first games to announce that they're coming. We also know Demio is coming there on a more general note. It does seem like the, there is so much coming to Vision Pro. We've only, we're only, uh, a month or two in we're only two months in and it's really interesting to constantly see this idea of you know did vision pro feel is vision pro over and you know think of where the original quest was two months in a lot of the staples that we have today a lot of the features of the platform including like hand tracking and link didn't even exist a lot of the biggest titles that people play today either didn't exist or hadn't been ported to quest yet it, it'll be really interesting to see um what it's like to get and an app like Rec Room natively on, on Vision Pro. All right, let's talk about this uh, next update, the Quest V64 update, focused mostly on Quest 3, bringing improved password quality, external microphone support, and lying down mode to Meta's headset. Are you using an external microphone today, David? No, we haven't had a chance to test that yet. We, you know, V64 only rolled out yesterday we'll start rolling out yesterday so you know we haven't had time to verify we don't want to have audio issues on on the podcast until we've properly tested that out but we do plan to because i'm using a quest 2 right now and the reason i'm using a quest 2 is that when i tried to use a quest 3 on this podcast there was this horrible plosives popping issue where anytime i used words like p and t that included the letters p and t you would get this muffling on the microphone that was just really unpleasant for our viewers and listeners. And that was the same issue with Quest Pro. And I'm not alone with this. There are plenty of people 
that don't use uh, the Quest 3 or Pro microphone for this exact same reason. It seems to just depend on how the headset sits on your face. But there, you know, there are plenty of VR YouTubers that have pointed this out. Uh, I, you know, I speak to people all the time in social VR that have this issue. You can you can hear them visibly. You can know if someone's using a Quest Pro or Quest 3 often by hearing that pop 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 um, pretty constantly. So that's why I'm using a Quest 2 right now, and that's why this is a a big feature the the external microphone support and that's coming as a uh, USB C port support so you can either plug in a mic that has a USB C connector or, or on its cable or you can use an adapter there are plenty of adapters for either uh, micro USB or even 3.5 millimeter uh, regular headphone jack microphones that you can use to plug them in on USB C so yeah that's going to be really interesting um to to try out when we when we try that out very soon. But that's not the flagship new feature of the V64 update, of course. The biggest difference is the improved pass-through. When, when Quest 3 first launched, Meta CTO Andrew Bosworth did say to spe- expect modest improvements over time in software. And so with V64, which is rolling out now, at six months into Quest 3, we are seeing the first update that does that. And here's specifically what Meta said has, has changed. So they're saying there are two things, improved resolution and improved image quality. So for improved resolution, they say they have improved the perceived resolution for pass-through by optimizing the pipeline. This makes it easier for users to see finer details and smaller text in the real world. The other change is they say, we have fine-tuned the camera processing to improve color, exposure, contrast, and dynamic range. This makes pass-through better match the real world. We have also reduced graininess in lower light conditions, making for an overall more comfortable pass-through experience in a range of lighting conditions. So I tried this hands-on, obviously. I, I had known that this was going to happen, so I have I compared V63 and V64 subjectively. What you can absolutely notice instantly is the better exposure and dynamic range, exposure control and dynamic range. The reason you can notice that is that when you look at a real screen, a, a monitor or a phone in your hand, you notice that it's no longer blown out. The the white light no longer kind of blows out over the text and makes it hard to read. And so you could always fix this, fix this in Quest 3 by going closer to the screen so that what the headset seems to do is dynamically expo- dynamically adjust the exposure to keep what you're looking at legible. So you'll notice this, that if you look at a, uh, you turn your head to a window in daylight in Quest 3, you'll notice the exposure come down so that the window is no longer blown out. Same way if you look at a screen. But with this new tweak, that no longer seems to be necessary. They've improved the dynamic range and the exposure. Now, interestingly, this is also something that we noticed was massively improved in Apple Vision Pro, as in from launch, it was and is better than Quest 3. It's one of the biggest things we praised. But the trade-off for here on Apple Vision Pro and in V64 is that you get this loss of overall brightness and vibrancy. So in our review of Vision Pro, we said, okay, so Vision Pro has its better exposure so you never even have to worry about stuff being blown out essentially you can go look at a real screen or your phone and you don't get that blown out you look at a window it's all it all just works in vision pro you can walk down the street in vision pro though you shouldn't for multiple reasons we've pointed out in our review you if you walk down the street things being blown out will not be the issue you run into but we did notice that one of the biggest downsides of vision pros pass through over quest 3 was that it was it felt darker and more constra- and more um, from a dynamic range perspective, more constrained. It just felt like a duller, less vibrant view of the world. Now, the interesting thing about that is that Quest 3's V64 update makes that exact same trade-off. It's not as uh, dull and l- less vibrant as Vision Pro, but it feels like it's gone halfway between launch Quest 3 and Vision Pro. So it's really, really fascinating to see Meta essentially take some of the learnings of Vision Pro's choices of how to tweak the cameras and apply it to Quest 3 because a lot of with a lot of these things, there's no magic solutions here. What you do is you make a trade-off. You adjust the camera processing so that it uh, it, it makes everything 
look better in one way and then you trade off another way. The other thing you can notice is reduced graininess. This is not a massive one, but you will notice that there is less noise in the images before. And this also likely comes from the way they've adjusted exposure and brightness. So John asking this question, uh, will it improve the Quest Pro pass through as well? And then I want to talk about that Zork VR comment right after. I want to get into that subject. That's a good question that we can revisit. But let's talk about this. Will it improve the Quest Pro pass through as well? That's an older chipset, an older system. And Meta has no inclination to kind of support it at the same level like there's no reason for them to support it at the same level as the much newer chipset so quest 3 is half the price much newer chipset and the chipset is the basis for their other devices going forward so they really should be focusing most of their time and energy on this just to serve themselves and that's really unfortunate for people that bought a quest pro so my answer to there is you know it's up to them but it's unlikely yeah, according to Meta, this improvement is only for Quest 3, and so is the external mic support. This is one of the first Quest updates that seems to almost exclusively focus on Quest 3. The improved pass-through quality, the external mic support, and the lying down mode are only on Quest 3. Though, of course, lying down mode already came to Quest 2 and Pro in the last update, V63. All right, so let's talk about this Zork VR comment so they're asking can you two give in any insights into whether the valve deckard is real or just an ups unsubstantiated dream uh valve is absolutely working on virtual reality and new vr hardware we have it in our reporting we uh yeah they, they they're they're still working on vr hardware they hired for people uh quite recently to work on new hardware in vr the question is exactly what form it takes what year it releases and uh what features are in that device but they're absolutely working on something it's just a question of when and i think it's that's when the dart darts get start getting thrown at the war you're at the wall you know you're uh you're working on valve time and you're talking about the launch of a completely new platform. What we've seen out of Valve so far is them figure out how to extend Steam to VR. They figured out how to have VR as a mode of play inside of Steam. And they effectively destroyed Windows Mixed Reality. Windows Mixed Reality tried to come out and, and compete with that or, or exist alongside it. Windows Mixed Reality very quickly started referring everyone to go and get Steam uh, instead of using Windows Mixed Reality. And then, of course, uh, even though Meta tried for a good long while with Rift and the Rift platform on PC, I think they had to throw in the towel as well to Steam. I, I mean, um, as I said last I week, I do disagree with I you know. on that one. I don't think... Meta was outcompeted by Valve on PC. That wasn't the issue there. The issue was Meta saw a bigger market standalone and didn't want to be playing a, a game where they had to, to divide their attention between PC and standalone. Meta, Rift S was selling well. Quest sold a lot, 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 lot better. They saw the opportunity to completely own the platform, you know, have this platform on standalone where they are the complete owners from end to end. They're not depending on Microsoft. They're not depending on NVIDIA. They're not depending on uh, Valve in any way. It's just them. But you're, you're right to say that, you know, Microsoft was definitely, I competed, but you could argue that Microsoft never put the effort in at all. And to just kind of pick up on what you're saying, yes, we, you know, to be absolutely explicit about this, Valve has said repeatedly for years now that they are working on a new headset. They have even posted job listings that include the phrases like shipping a new headset to more than a million people. You know, this is clearly something that they are doing. They have repeatedly said that they're working on a headset. What they haven't said is when, what their timeline is for actually making that a product, for actually releasing that. I expect they want to. Uh, I expect that what they, what happened is that the success of Steam Deck means that they decided to focus on it more in the short term and push the headset out a little bit further. I also expect that they want access to OLED micro displays, just like, just like Apple has, just like we expect Samsung will, just like we expect eventually 
all headsets will be using these OLED micro displays and uh, getting that and being able to put that into a affordable product is going to take a few years. Yeah, I, I think what I'm what I'm struggling with there, David, is, is you're you're not wrong, but like we have a little bit different, I think, conception of of what Apple did with this headset with the Vision Pro. So you you've compared it to an iPad or at least a replacement for an iPad. Like it it erases the use case of an iPad pretty effectively with the ability to run all of those apps. Uh, but it doesn't quite close the gap to a laptop. Like you're using so much of the processor just to run the system. You're not getting well, all the all the oomph out of a laptop out of this. Headset. I don't think that's the reason. I think it's that it's it's the operating system. It's a software decision. It's based on iPad OS. It doesn't run Mac OS apps. You can't run Xcode and build an app, not even just for Vision Pro. You can't build an app for iPhone on a Vision Pro. You can't you can't open, you know, Adobe Premiere Pro. You can't run the apps that keep people using Mac no, and Windows. And it's the same problem with iPad Pro. It's I Apple pitched iPad Pro and still does as a computer replacement, but it doesn't give it the ability to run computer software. And that's why it never can be. Now, this could change one day. The Vision OS 5 could come along and Apple could say, Vision headsets can now run Mac apps. Boom, now you've changed that. Now it can be a laptop replacement, but until that happens, it simply can't be. And that's why so much of the focus of Vision Pro is extending your Mac into a giant virtual screen. Yeah, I, I, fantastic. I mean, he, he's ab, you're absolutely right. Uh, the the one reason I'm still using the Mac so much is because I need Photoshop, and there's no real easy Photoshop uh, editing tools on the Vision Pro. So I'm constantly connecting my Mac virtual display to, to get access to that. The reason I'm focusing so much on this is everyone, everyone in our comments, everyone in this room, wants a pc in vr we want what is it what is a vr pc what does it look like what are you able to do with it what what does that look like and we want valve to do it we want valve to show us what does a p they did it with a handheld they've shown us what a handheld pc looks like that is what a steam deck is now do it for a vr headset that's whatever we, we all want it absolutely the question is just how powerful is it and what's it capable of doing? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's by basing Vision OS off iPad OS and, and trying to extend the same mobile OS architecture that started with the iPhone, bringing that as their spatial computing approach, Apple has left this massive hole open for another company to come along and give a real desktop PC operating system. If, if that's Valve's strategy, not only can they leverage the fact that Steam is obviously a place for for gaming and they can presumably either have this thing be really easily connect to a PC wirelessly, just like a Steam Link app on Quest, but they can deliver a productivity um, solution here that none of the current standalone he headsets do because they're all based on mobile operating systems. As you say, if they come along with Steam OS on a standalone headset and you can run full desktop applications, and then they combine that with obviously their Proton compatibility layer that can bring over a lot of Windows apps. That's a game changer. They All they have to do at that point is convince some uh, developers like um, Adobe and such to put their stuff on Steam, which isn't a huge ask when you think about the fact that they wouldn't, from a development perspective, have to do that much compared to their current approach. Yeah, that's a big idea to think about them extending Wow, I hadn't even I hadn't even really considered them being able to extend that surface of Steam. If 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 they could actually extend Steam to contain creative apps, right? Like that would be a, a massive win for them. Didn't they launch a video store and then pulled away from that? Uh, I'm not sure, but they do have. There already are apps on Steam. Like Steam is not just for games. As James O'Loughlin is pointing out, Adobe has their substance tools on mm. Steam. Um, I, OBS is on Steam. You know, the OBS we're running right now is coming through Steam. Yeah. Steam has Blender, Mr. Myceum is pointing out. If you do get this one headset that can actually be a spatial computing laptop, not a spatial computing iPad, I think you do will see the incentive, especially if Valve is willing to do what it did with Steam Deck and price aggressively. You know, with the index, Valve was 
probably at, at least after the first six months making a healthy profit there. But with Steam Deck, we, we've seen Gabe Newell talk about this as being like a difficult decision to price it. Like based on the way he's speaking about that, Steam Deck is either sold at cost or subsidized. And that's a huge indicator for what Valve might do with a headset. And I don't like it's it's ironic that the company that's, you know, behind Steam might not actually have a huge focus on the headset itself running games. Games might not be the focus simply because of the things we've talked about in the past. This idea that Steam is running all of this content designed to be run on a 400 watt computer plugged into a wall. And this headset is going to be like a 10 to 15 watt at most headset. So you can't make steam vr games run magically on a standalone headset unless you have this entirely separate store what you can do is make a wireless adapter that makes it really easy regardless of your network setup to connect to a pc that people are already using what you could also theoretically do is release a steam deck 2 uh you know two or three years from now that does have the horsepower to run a vr games uh potentially when it's plugged into a wall you could have like similar to the way the Nintendo Switch runs at higher clock speeds when it's plugged in versus on battery. You could have the situation where you get your Steam Deck 2, you plug it in, it ramps up to the max clock speeds and then streams wirelessly to your uh, Deckard headset, potentially. Yeah, it's it's funny to think about uh, potentially Apple Vision Pro and Steam Deck featuring the same fundamental problem in design. They're both too big and heavy. And I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's an, like a, a demonstration of the platform, right? Like Apple had to ship something too bulky and heavy in order to extend their platform, their, everything they do into VR. Now you could maybe think of the same thing happening over with, with Valve and with a Deckard or a Steam Deck, right? If Valve actually wanted to ship a VR headset now that was a whole PC inside of a headset, is it just too darn heavy and too big of a machine for them to actually ship? And they need to just make more progress before they can actually do it. Yeah, I think if you wanted to somehow d deliver a standalone headset that could somehow run typical Steam VR content, it would have to be like at the size of a motorbike helmet or, you know, you'd have to have like a backpack PC almost. It would have to be not just like a, a puck. You would have to have something that you pretty much strap to yourself, more like a tactical vest than anything. You know, the physics here, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. Not only from a compute perspective and heating, from a battery perspective too, you know, you, how do you get a battery that big? If you even talk about the size of the, the Vision Pro battery, that's not going to do this. If you want to actually run the kind of energy that you're going to need to run PC VR, it's it's just not feasible, which is why I really strongly suspect that Valve is going to focus from, from a gaming perspective, from a high performance 3D perspective on using your existing PC or a Steam Deck too. It makes so much sense. We've also seen Valve quite recently, I think it was in December, hint a lot about wireless being a huge part of their future focus about wireless streaming now some say that could have been about steam link for quest but it also to me indicates that steam link for quest could be part of building up that tech to be ready for their own headset eventually and then the head it doesn't mean the headset itself won't do anything on its own but what it could do on its own is the 2d apps right so it has enough computing power on it to do uh, you know, run an environment, do your hand tracking, your eye tracking, your mixed reality segmentation, all of that runs on board. But then when you want to run something like Half-Life Alex or Flight Simulator or something like that, the headset connects to your PC and that's where that's done. Rather than trying to chase this impossible problem of putting, uh, you know, a fighter jet into your living room, you just, you, you don't solve that. You solve that by just using the PC. And you know, it makes sense for Valve to do this. It doesn't make sense for any other company to do this because they don't have Steam. They don't have the dominant PC distribution platform, but Valve has that. Why not double down on it? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it a little bit further here on just thinking about the potential here, right? Like if my Steam Deck is docked on uh, a power outlet, I don't mind it streaming all the time, any any piece of content that's on it. So Having a Steam Deck operate as your flat screen PC, that anything that's that plays great on Steam Deck could be transported locally with very minimal latency to your headset, so you could enjoy all of that uh, content locally. But then you've got all the very deep 
complex worlds. You've got VR Chat and Half Life Alex and Elite Dangerous and uh, Flight Simulator, all those things that are going to live inside of a tower that's about this big, uh, sucking down power all the time. We also want all of those worlds accessible inside headset. And right now it's it's happening on Apple Vision Pro and on MetaQuest, right? You can easily access all of those worlds where the only, like, Valve hasn't shown us what their model here is. One of the models that we've seen in patents and we've discussed is this super low, uh, low, you know, super thin headset that streams everything locally, right? Uh, and maybe you've got a battery pack that's connected in your pocket, or it could be potentially on the headset. That That is another route here that, that Valve could take. And it's not putting everything in the headset, but it would still effectively give you the entire Steam operating system directly inside the headset, wherever wherever you are. Yeah, I think we're, we're saying much the same thing here. That I, you know, I think the only disagreement is I think the headset won't just do streaming. I think it will have onboard compute, but for a lot of the 2D applications. So if you think well, of your, your Vision Pro experience where you know you have one window up here and another window up here, that's it's completely feasible to do that in a standalone form factor. The difficulty is when you're trying to then render a complex 3D environment and that's where the PC comes in. But you know, it's it's po very possible that they will figure out an architecture where these things happen at the same time. And some of what you're seeing is done on the headset, the, the 2D windows, while other parts of what you're seeing are done on the PC. So while you're in Half-Life Alex, you bring up a web browser and that web browser is being done by the headset, just as your hand tracking segmentation and maybe your, your hand and arm segmentation, like Envision Pro is being done on the headset. Um, but the actual 3D environment behind you and all of the, the game logic is being done over on the PC. Yeah. So I think where we're going with that is we, we we're starting to get a picture of what Valve maybe should do. Right, like you can imagine this device that has very smart computer vision in it, uh, sensing your environment, giving you a room layout, giving you hands and uh, showing your room at a very nice resolution. And then everything else, uh, like to your point, could stream uh, as well as maybe a little bit locally. But that's a long, that's a long segment here and a good transition to get into our last subject here talking about the growth of PC VR on Steam. Yeah, the, the last thing I just want to say in our last segment, the, the Quest 3 pass-through, is I think this this kind of software change makes me somewhat optimistic that Meta's, not their next headset, because that's going to be the cheaper Quest 3 model, but the headset after that, I think will come very close to or exceed Vision Pro's pass-through in some pretty critical ways at a cheaper cost. I think... You know, Meta has obviously seen how important pasture is here. It's probably a huge focus for them from an engineering and research perspective. I, I think the Quest Pro 2 or whatever it ends up being called might deliver quite remarkable pass-through for, you know, a fraction of the price of Vision Pro. So Clay's comment here before we move on, uh, PC Grunt makes sense to me, but I really think for the masses, server-side GPU is the future. I've been really struggling with this idea. I think it makes a lot of sense, but it it just... It assumes too much. I've seen too many years of of attempts to stream video games into the home to your hand, and they're making improvements. Like they're 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 improving by leaps and bounds. But what you're you're doing is you're limiting your market share to whoever has the fastest internet. You you don't reach any of the rural people when you stream from a server and if that's the only way you can stream you lose out on a huge segment of the audience that just simply cannot go and get a box and put it in their home and have and have a great vr experience you're you're limiting them to move to a high density location a city and even there i have problems with that where like what happens when you sell too many devices and too many people all want to use that network in that location all at the same time? You're suddenly back in what what you and I have talked about, that editorial that I've got uh, sitting in uh, the wings here. You're stuck in traffic again. You're, you're repeating the problems of the 20th century with modern technology where you've got too many people trying to pull bandwidth down or pull things down from the internet at the same time. And it takes longer than it should yeah i mean i i do think 
cloud is going to be the long-term future. The only question is how long it's going to take. As, as some commenters are pointing out, Wabo pointing out, internet connectivity gets better every year. The issue of latency, though, is not solvable with technology unless you're in the same city. What I, what no cloud streaming provider of, of cl cloud game streaming provider has done or had the balls to do, but really should do, is just do this per city. Because they all want to just do per country, right? You're in a country. But being in that country means that you could either be a huge distance away from one of their server centers or right beside it. And if you're right beside it, you're going to have a great experience. You're going to go, wow, cloud gaming is so much better than I thought. I've never knew that this could even be possible. This feels the same as using a console. And there are there have been you know end-to-end -end latency tests done that show that if you're in the same city as uh, a cloud provider on something like Xbox Cloud Gaming or GeForce Now, it actually has pretty much the same latency as using a uh, home console like an Xbox, right? The different the problem is if you're not, it gets worse and worse the further away you are. And I that's that's really the solution here. As you say, yes, it limits the market, but cities are huge, right? There's there's always that trend you hear that if you look over time, yeah, the percentage okay. of humans that live in a city is increasing every single year. And eventually I think by 2050, like something like the vast, vast, vast majority of humans are going to live in a city. So yes, I think some of these companies just need to have the balls to say, if you're not within distance of our data center, we're not going to provide you the service because it's going to suck, especially for VR. There's no point in trying to do something with that high latency. But from a perspective of all the people who do live in a city and are nearby, it, it is it is pretty much an inevitability. And I think they're going to be able to just build out enough capacity for the people, right? Like this is something where it's just a manufacturing problem. There were huge supply chain issues during COVID, but from indications, we're pretty much past that now. Yes, there's also the fact that a lot of NVIDIA's um, production right now is going to AI chips and they're not putting as much focus on gaming chips. But if there's a market here of subscribers, of people who are actually paying a recurrent uh, monthly fee to access these service, they will you know, bring in supply to meet that demand. Daniel Leeper saying, I can literally play PC VR gaming in the cloud now and it's fine, right? We had Plutosphere on our show several weeks ago talking about how they uh, had a, a streaming agreement or a, a bandwidth agreement that undermined the whole company and uh, helped it go out of business quite suddenly, which they're doing exactly what you're describing, but couldn't make a business out of it. Um, and a lot well, of people yeah, are seeing... Sorry, go ahead. Just the huge issue with Pluto Sphere is that they weren't able to get on the Quest Store. Like if we imagine that, you know, next week Meta releases cloud streaming, right? And you go on to the, the Quest Store one day and you see that you can now, like, I don't know, uh, buy a cloud version of one of the original Rift games, like Asgard's Wrath 1 or Stormlands or whatever, so, right? That's going to be a much, much different perspective than if you have to go and sideload. So I think what I'm, what I'm struggling with on the the whole streaming idea, or this idea that some people can stream from the cloud just fine and some people can't, is there's every type of game in the world imaginable, right? Like there's, you're talking about 150 person modern warfare, you know, war zone games, where you've got to get 150 people from wherever, right? They're, they're trying to gather thousands and thousands of people and then parse them out into little groups that will cluster the most players together geographically. So you have the lowest latency experience. And like you have this giant corporation putting hundreds of people all against the idea of let's make Warzone bigger. Let's let's get more people into this game. Let's make it a, a giant battle royale for the ages. And like when you start doing and that, you may lose some of the like there's there's a reason why people are loving Helldivers so much, right? You've just got a crew of a few people going together and feeling this com camaraderie against a third like a like against the environment they're not fighting each other necessarily they're fighting a computer ally you've got all of these amazing different sorts of like ways of people playing together like but to your point david like if we if we were limited to same city multiplayer of uh, if you could stream from the cloud multiplayer what games are going to work in that format how you get enough people where you can only play against people that are in the same city well and what do you do when you your friend is on the other coast and they want to play with you well no these are separate things right the the client that 
cloud client that's in your city can still connect from a multiplayer perspective to other people because that's no longer the same thing. That's now you're just sending these tiny packets of information. That's different. What you can do if you run same city multiplayer is deliver much, much greater than 128, which is the current, you know, cap in the likes of Battlefield and Call of Duty. I think you could do thousands of people simultaneously because you're no longer from you're no longer actually processing over the internet. The actual gameplay itself, the server and clients are all in the same data center with, you know, uh, gigabits or even terabits of bandwidth between each other. And that's that's something that, that Thedia talked about potentially doing. And, you know, we have a comment um, asking, you know, well, if, if these ideas are so great, I think it's James O'Loughlin saying, why didn't Stadia work as a business? I think Stadia's specific issue was that it just didn't have the games, right? They, It's the same issue as arguably why something like Pico might have failed in a way. Pico obviously did a lot more in Stadia, but the reason that Xbox Cloud Gaming is working in Stadia didn't is that Xbox is that Stadia had like 10% of the library, right? They didn't have the games. I don't think it was anything to do with the technology. I just think Google essentially launched a new console with Stadia. And if you want to think about what it would mean to launch a console to compete with Xbox and PlayStation, you have to somehow get a huge percentage of the titles that are available on Xbox and PlayStation to support your console. And Google didn't do that. They did not actually, they didn't realize that if you want to do that, you need an investment that's an order of magnitude bigger. And it's not about investing in the tech. The, the server investment is going to look like small small fries. It's going to look like absolutely nothing. It's going to look like a decimal point when it comes to the real investment, which is going out there and paying developers and publishers to port onto a completely new and unproven console. Yeah, and our commenters knowing that Google lacked that commitment. I think what are, the missing part of that, David, is the games that we never got to see Google make because they they didn't want to cough up that cost would have been different than the games architected for a different server architecture. There would have been subtle little feeling differences to the way that game functions when it's operating natively on the Stadia, Stadia network. Uh, it's it's not going to be architected the same. They're going to build little things to make it feel like it lives within that system. And they, yeah, they did not have the, they just didn't push it through, right? Like they pulled up stakes, they killed by Google, just that same old story from them. Um, improbable. What the heck happened to Improbable IO? So it was a startup that was funded with massive amounts of money. Uh, and they were doing some of this, David. Weren't they doing... Uh, massively, massively multiplayer online interactions to try to solve exactly what we're discussing here. How do you have thousands of, of interactions online simultaneously? Yeah, they were. They were trying to figure out how you can do this, not with cloud streaming, but with traditional clients and how can you solve the problem of the fact that if you're in a, an MMO currently, the vast majority will use different servers um, except for something like EVE Online, which has one giant server. But even within that, almost every MMO has people divided into instances. You go to the capital city in an MMO. And if you think about this from like a childhood dream and a childhood fantasy, you want to go to the capital city and see thousands of other players uh, filling the streets. But you don't. You see a hundred other players at most. And then there's another instance, a completely parallel universe of this same city where there's another hundred. And you have, as, as everything fills up each time, one instant fills up, another instance is spawned. And that's all separate. What Improbable was trying to do was solve that problem and somehow uh, get you know thousands of people into the same instance. It's something like you think intuitively, given the scale of uh, social networks, for example, like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and the, the amount of simultaneous you know comments and likes and interactions they're able to support you feel like this would be something that is somehow solvable but i don't know if improbable's problem was anything to t do with tech i think it might have just been the standard you know business running out of money kind of uh problem in terms of not being able to deliver that so far i'm seeing people in our comments discussing smash hit i've got to bring that up uh it's completely off subject uh not even a tangent here but Smash Hit was a game on Gear VR. It was originally on iOS, as I recall. And uh, funny enough, I installed it on Vision Pro. It's still, it's one of those compatible apps that you can install. You go into the store. And uh, the way it works is you look and then press a button and fire a ball at where you're looking. 
um, doesn't quite work uh, exactly as it w- did. It doesn't work as well as it did on Gear VR on Vision Pro. It's actually quite straining to kind of look around and keep pinching uh, to fire the balls. But it was an amazing game uh, back in the day for Gear VR just because it, it felt, I played that game all the way through to completion almost in the first two sittings. And then the developers, I think, just got interested in other things and went away from VR. Uh, very tragic sort of story there, but uh, multiple people discussing Smash Hit out in our comments. I would love to see that reborn. There's a lot of games in the spirit of Smash Hit, but I just I just want Smash Hit. The physics were fantastic. The glass breaking apart. That game needs to come back. Yeah, um, do we want to move on to our, our final topic then? Yep. Let's talk about PC VR growth on Steam. This is a hot subject for our community. It's a big subject. It's hard to get into. And we hope that maybe uh, our perspective and the context we're adding here can help inform some discussions out there about exactly what is the market opportunity for VR on Steam, on PC in general. And just we'd love to know how many people are playing PC VR games on a regular basis. But it's still not possible to necessarily get that number. David, why don't you break it down for us why you think Steam VR is growing? Yeah, well, the argument I'm going to make is the argument I made in the article on uploadvr.com, which is that we pretty much can figure out that number. And that if you look at the percentage um, that Valve provides, it's misleading for two reasons. So you know that every month Valve releases their Steam hardware survey, and there's a VR section, and as well as showing um, the percentage of each headset that of overall Steam VR usage, they will also give you a figure that shows that the percentage of Steam users that used any headset at all in that month. And if you look at that figure, you'll notice that it's actually slightly trending down ever since Valve changed to the current methodology back after the release of Half-Life Alex. So you get this slight reduction over time in the number of people uh, the percentage of people, the percentage of Steam users using VR. And so you might look at this and at face value think, okay, so PC VR is shrinking. So there's there's two important considerations here, though, that mean that that's actually not true. The first one is that this is a percentage. This is a percentage of overall Steam users. So the last figure we got was that there are 132 monthly active Steam users, 132 million monthly active Steam users. And that's been going up over the years. So if this were to stay completely still, that would actually mean that PC VR is still growing. If this number were not to change at all, because it would be as a percentage of a growing number, the overall number of Steam users. However, that in itself is not much consolidation because even if we were to say, okay, what this figure here means is that PC VR is probably staying stagnant and it's just not keeping up with the growth of Steam. That's not much consolidation, right? That's the consolation. That's terrible, right? You want to see PC VR growing, not just you know barely keeping pace. And so when you take the second consideration into account, you realize that actually it is. And that consideration is that the number of Chinese users on Steam has been dramatically growing over the past four years as well. And if you actually filter them out, because you, each month the Steam hardware survey shows the percentage of users that are using English, Chinese, German, etc. If you factor that out, and so you normalize the data relative to the number of Chinese users each month, you see this chart, which shows that the number of non-Chinese Steam users using a VR headset has actually been steadily growing. And if you look at this figure of where it is and you compare that to the last known Steam monthly active user number, 132 million, you get to somewhere around roughly 3 million people using PC VR on Steam every month. It's a lot of math there. A lot of uh, very interesting things. I, I, is, am I understanding this right, David? Is it, is it basically Valve doesn't care where you access Steam from? They don't, they don't really care. Uh, but they ask, you know, in their Steam hardware survey, they're just uh, 
taking a record of what language people speak, and that's the indication of how many people in China are using it? Yeah, this is the number. It's the, the language of your PC, right? The language of your Steam app, which is set by default as the language of your PC. I think you can manually change it if you want to. So Steam actually does have like a separate version in China, but a lot of Chinese users do use a VPN and get onto this global version of Steam. And the reason that we're kind of filtering them out is that in China, you don't have Quest officially sold. You don't have Valve Index officially sold. You don't have many of the PC VR headsets officially sold. Yes, you have Pico, but Pico's success, even within China, has not been at the scale that it, relative to the West. It, the Chinese market is very different to the Western VR market. And it's, it's interesting in its own ways. And it's really difficult to penetrate and understand it because of the obvious uh, barriers there, the the Great Firewall and some of the, the uh, difficulty of getting um, honest statistics out of China. But what we do know is it's a lot more focused on standalone media viewers. The Chinese equivalent of Netflix, the company that basically is Netflix in China, right? It's it's. I'm not saying it's associated with Netflix. I'm saying it's their equivalent of Netflix releases its own line of headsets that have its service preloaded onto them. And it's a standalone headset. It's not focused on room scale gaming. It's like, imagine a Quest-like hardware, but with an Apple Vision Pro focus, except instead of Apple TV Plus, it's uh, the, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the service. So you don't see those kind of headsets being used for PC much. Um, and it's just, because of that different market, I don't think you should include the Chinese users when you're looking at the Steam PC VR users. Lots of interesting things to consider there. Where is this comment basically trying to understand? So the argument is the rate of VR growth is slower than the rate of Steam growth. And that, that is basically no. the underlying the, situation, right? No, that's only that was only oh. even if we did, even if this statistic didn't include any Chinese users. If you imagine that Chinese users were not on this and this was the picture, yes, that's what we're saying. That's I'm saying that even if you don't look at the Chinese aspect, you can say that because the number of overall Steam users is growing in this time, right? This is a percentage of the overall, then yes. But what I'm saying is even if that doesn't matter, even if you say, screw it, even if the number of Steam users had stayed the exact same, the fact that the the so many are Chinese and then over time the number of Chinese users has been increasing when you factor those out it is growing like one of the things you could always notice is if you were in a hardware survey month where you saw VR usage slightly decrease you would always go into the language section and see oh the number of Chinese users has dramatically increased and in fact on a month like this where you see a massive drop what did you see? A massive increase in Chinese users. And so that's what uh, people had to kind of, that's what we had to figure out here. And it's the missing piece that shows. Now, I'm not saying that PC VR is exploding. This is obviously still very modest growth. This is not something that is becoming, a, you know, a way that a huge percentage of PC gamers use their uh, PC. But it's it's still huge. It's bigger than Linux. It's similar to the number of people that own a 4K monitor. That's actually a really interesting fact that I don't think a lot of people notice. The number of people who own a VR headset on Steam is very similar to the number of people who own a 4K monitor and the rest are using 1440p or 1080p. So where is this comment here, Jack? The big two game publishers have deliberately kept their blue chip brands out of VR, almost all of which would require PC VR. EA and Activision have been low-key embargoing VR development, and we all know it. Very interesting perspective. It it that comment feels feels accurate in like its its overall sense. Like it feels like it's 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 spot on. We do need to remind uh, people who have not been in VR. Like we've been in VR for a very long time, but we've we've forgotten that the big publishers actually did. Uh, build a few experiences for the first generation PlayStation VR. So there was a, what it was a call of duty uh, experience, right? Where you could fly in one of their planes for a very short amount of time uh, on sort of like an on rails mission. And uh, there were, there was like a star Wars mission uh, that you could do. What, 
what hasn't matched up well, is sorry, there, there, was, there wasn't just a star wars mission there was a full ea star wars game star wars squadrons which is a, a game for before regular the, consoles and pc that got squadrons. vr support sorry before squadrons there was yeah a mission right yeah but i'm saying so, they, yes. they followed that up with a full game the, the star wars squadrons is a full game that that from ea that runs in vr the the thing i've lamented so many times is it's a, it's a sh crying shame that it didn't come to playstation vr2 and also i think it could come to quest 3 if they really wanted to but it's obviously development of that's been long since stopped it's right to say that they pulled back there but there was a time where ea was re did release a major game for vr yeah i think it's it was, what what the issue here is that you've got to have like a a light at the end of the tunnel for these publishers to know that they can keep milking that product year after year after year after year. And I mean, in the big publisher's defense, imagine if you had, I don't know, taken, I'm just gonna throw out numbers here. Let's say $50 million to make a Medal of Honor game uh, for a PC VR platform that was dead by the time you released it. I mean, that's, that is close to what happened with that property. And then of course there was a quest port of that game, but that's kind of the issue here is that there isn't a matchup of the opportunity for the product. And I, I think about this a lot. It's actually occupying way too much of my brain power to think about this. So if you have more information out there, you can help me understand what's going on here. Uh, I, I would love it. But you look back at the history uh, last year, you had Asgard's Wrath 2 release, and you also had Assassin's Creed release. And as I understand it, Ubisoft came out and said it wasn't actually like enough money for us to keep investing in these sorts of VR games. Is that right? Am I well, misrepresenting no, that? No, they said they're not going to increase their investment. They didn't say they're not going to invest. They just said that it's not enough to justify increasing their investment. Well, so I read that reading between the lines on that, it's like uh, it's 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 a negotiating tactic. Meta has to come and foot the bill for Ubisoft to come out and make the next next Assassin's Creed VR title is, is the way I read that. So it's like a challenge to Meta. Hey, actually pony up enough for us to go make the game. But I think the indication th that I'm reading off of that is there wasn't enough money made on just pure sales of the game to necessarily warrant them doing a whole lot more and i if like asgard's wrath 2 is very well loved by a lot of players out there it was a breath of fresh air in a in a sea of content that just wasn't the depth that they wanted but what i'm what, the issue i have with that is like these games aren't aren't the size they are organically they, there's no organic building of a triple a game that just makes its sales on like it, it it doesn't get built up i would argue what uh h3 vr hot dogs horseshoes and hand grenades the game i bring up a lot it is as close as you can come in this field to a developer single-handedly building up a very large audience adding piece after piece after piece to a game that's actually pretty expansive for the genre that it's in but we won't call that triple a uh, content and you were making that joke over on twitter about meta's definition of triple a gaming right like how do we get to a place where a big publisher like ea or activision or, or uh, blizzard can make a game that's big enough just on vr alone for them to recoup their costs and build that team out bigger yeah i think it's a really good point what you're saying is completely accurate we're still not at the point where you can or a big publisher can organically make the kind of revenue on a vr game that justifies triple a asgard's wrath 2 i would heavily wager that meta is not going to make back its investment on it but that's not the point the point is to sell quest headsets right it's a loss leader in a sense but that's not a completely unheard of strategy. We've seen from some of the leaked financials from Sony Studios that some of their biggest PlayStation 5 games either barely made a profit or made no profit at all. So from a platform perspective, it's completely reasonable to see Meta continue to invest in titles like Asgard's Wrath 2. 
and use that as a marketing expense. But as you say, that's a completely different question to what will get a publisher to justify it. Because if you look at the kind of games that are on console from Ubisoft and EA, the ones that aren't exclusives, those are games that they are actually expecting to make a large profit on and make enough profit to build another game. And when it comes to that, the issue is just market size, right? If you are making a game for uh, PlayStation 4 and 5 and the last gen Xbox and the current gen Xbox, you're addressing a market of like 150 million people. If you're even if you decide, you know, we're going to make something higher fidelity and we're only going to go for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S, that's still a market of like, you know, uh, 60 or 70 million people. In, in comparison, Quest headsets have sold like roughly something like 25 million. There's just not the same market size. So the only solution there is to get more people in the VR, is to, ke- is to get more people to buy a headset and be a part of the target market. And that's why it's so important to, to get headsets that people can actually afford and that they want to buy and they think is worth the value. Some people have this instinctive reaction to the idea of a cheaper Quest 3 of being like, you know, oh, this is completely wrong. Meta should be going the other direction. They should be making a Quest 3 Plus or a Quest 3 Pro. And then in the same breath, some of those people will say, why are we not seeing more AAA games from big publishers? Well, they don't care if there's a Quest 3 Plus or a Pro that sells 500,000 units. That's not moving the needle for whether they build a game. Mm-hmm. What gets publishers to build a game is a big market, right? The the, the Wii U is considered like the, the biggest failure in modern major consoles. It sold something like 12 million units. So Quest is only just with the Quest 2 generation gotten past that, as in it's gotten to, you know, roughly double that. But before that, VR was so small that it hadn't even reached the level of the, the biggest failure, the Wii U. With Quest 2, you finally have VR in the space of mainstream. It's at the point where, you know, I hate this, these terms of AAA and, and, and AA, but it's at the point where you probably can have publishers justify building AA games. And you do see ports, for example, you know, we've seen like Tropico come, you see uh, p- ports of, of major titles come into VR all the time now because of the Quest 2 market. But to get to the AAA one organically, you need a bigger push. We need the Quest market to grow into 40 million, 50 million, 60 million, and only doing something like releasing a Quest 3 Lite or a Quest 3 S combined with major marketing and combined with more games is going to get us to that point. $3,500 headsets aren't going to get us there. $1,000 headsets aren't going to get us there. You need something that sells at the scale of consoles. A Nintendo Switch is $300 or, you know, it's 300 pounds. I assume it's the same in dollars. Xbox and PlayStation, they range between, you know, 250 and 450. The Quest 3 starts at 500. You need something that can, that has the horsepower to deliver a high fidelity experience combined with the price to reach a mass market. And hopefully that's what Meta will do with the cheaper Quest 3 model coming later this year. Mm, lots of things I think we're going to discuss on an ongoing basis there. This isn't a going, like this discussion isn't going to go away. It's going to only get uglier with time. I, I, I'm actually kind of, we've always resisted the AAA moniker. Like I haven't wanted to use it. And to me, uh, that name implies forever game and it it for it implies a game that will um reliably produce returns for your stockholders it 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 almost feels like it's a coded term to say what game will make my uh stock report that i have to give every quarter actually turn out good and i i don't think that necessarily matches up with gaming interests It, it, it matches up it matches up gamers' interests with what the stockholders actually want. It doesn't follow like a no, no Man's Sky is the model in my mind. How the heck did No Man's Sky, like that's a AAA game if there ever was one, but it, they had to fight tooth and nail to achieve that status. I mean, I still think it is useful because there is a certain type of gamer that is a massive, massive market that is a bigger percentage of console sales than I think you're giving them credit for that does only care about the AAA games, right? There is the, the classic example of um, there was a study done that shown that like a huge percentage of Xbox 360 and PS3 players only got it to play Call of Duty and only played Call of Duty. There in the UK, for example, there are a lot of people that buy their console only to play FIFA, the you know the football game. I assume it's similar in America with sports that are more popular in America. 
and the American football and and basketball games. I'm sure uh, there are a lot of people. There are the kind of people who the only games they care about are the blockbusters. The same way that there are a huge percentage of people that only go to the cinema to watch the the, the latest blockbuster movie right some of them even just go to the cinema to watch the summer blockbuster and then never go near the cinema for the rest of the year and yes there are these amazing films that that you know people who are more kind of high art minded enjoy throughout the year but they don't they don't make the same kind of money that that big billion dollar blockbuster does and that's why to get people into vr you need to do this it's like these kind of games we talk about these triple a games they're not the kind of thing that in many ways, a lot of the existing users want, but they are, they're almost marketing expenses. That's what I called them earlier. And that's what they are. I don't think they're just for shareholders, but they're as much for marketing as anything. They're your first game. They're the game that you try to convince someone to buy a headset to get. And then once they're in the headset, then they start to look at, oh, wait, there's actually this indie game that just went on sale that looks really good. Maybe I'll give it a try that my friend told me about, or I saw a YouTuber play that actually. And then from there you start to go, oh, well, now these kind of games are good. Let me look at this one and this one. I think that's the entry path. It's like the AAA games are the gateway drug of gaming. And then the indie games are the the, the drug that you go on to after. <laughs> uh, that's rough. That's a, that's a tough note to end on, right? Like here we are uh, with gaming. You know, we, we have words like addiction uh, that are actually pretty sensitive to a lot of people because... Uh, Right. I've I've reported on people and there are people in our community. Right. There's people in our audience who have spent hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of hours in places like VR chat. Uh, and they whether that's a, an addiction is an active question. Right. Like I've seen people argue at length nonstop over whether they can balance their gaming with the rest of their lives and like. I hate to think of this idea that like you're you're hooking a person on a game system such that they can't get rid of it. That's that's not like that's becoming much similar to the the gambling idea of video games than the creative places that we we get to like enjoy storytelling and fantasies and and role playing with one another and and having an effect on the world. Uh, those are all cool things we can do with games, but they're not the same as uh, what you just described, which is that you you are being drawn back in with what loot boxes and all these little things to try to keep your game going just a little bit longer. Wow, 5,000 VRC hours and counting Whew. in our comments. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting philosophical discussion of where does passion and interest become addiction? And I think you know, it's, it's pretty well established that it becomes an addiction when it negatively affects the rest of your life. As in, does it affect, does it negatively affect your education, your career, your personal relationships? If it affects any of those things, uh, or, you know, your hygiene or your health would be the other ones. If it affects any of those things, then it's an addiction. But if it, if you, if you have all those things in check, right, if you, if you remember to eat and you drink enough water and you, you, you know, keep, maintain healthy relationships with other human beings in the real world, and you, you either you show up to your job and you do your hours and you, you work hard. And if you have all those things together, then what you do with your free time, spend as much, if that's what you enjoy, I don't think, you know, anyone's in a position to tell anyone else what to do with their free time as long as they don't let that affect the, other things in their life of course yeah i think the that's a good note to sort of wrap up here i think we're talking really sensitively about this we're like we're trying to be understanding there's right there's the people who uh who really need uh their online connections because it's so hard for them to achieve them in the physical world and those people are out there too and we we want to understand what they're going through but like what we started off some of this discussion with david is those unattended children in vr chat and rec room and they're being left you know they're being babysat by those headsets uh instead of their parents watching them or instead of their parents going and finding an actual physical play friend to go out and play in the street with right uh they're giving them a vr headset and letting them go loose and not realizing that it is not the same thing to be let loose in with embodiment in a virtual space as it is to really do anything else. Uh, it, it's just a completely different thing. And 
yeah, that's, that's what's happening in these spaces. Yeah. As you say, the, there is that real need for uh real world third spaces that right now gaming in many ways fulfills discord fulfills for people and uh, VR has the potential to fulfill. Um, I, I'm so torn on whether VR acting as a substitute for that is a good thing overall. I mean, I think you don't want it to be a crutch that means that investment isn't put in to bring back third spaces for the real world. But at the same time, if people are having a meaningful social connection in a virtual space, that can't be discounted and it can't, you know, this this harsh distinction between real and physical and, and virtual shouldn't be drawn so readily if what people are engaging with with other real people in a virtual sense is meaningful to them. Yeah, my apologies for going off on a tangent there on a sort of a random thing, but I think it was worth it to close off on that. I think I want to mention I want to mention one last thing. Uh, was it last Friday late in the week? There was a policy change from Apple where they said that they would start accepting emulators or classic games uh, to the App Store, and I think that's I'm I'm extremely curious to see what sort of classic gaming ideas we see rebirthed in in VR over the next six months to a year. These these old ideas for gaming with friends uh, in with personas as the basis of your interaction. Um, but yeah, uh, we're going to keep getting into these subjects and go where the conversation takes us. And uh, thank you for Recycled. I come for the news, but stay for the tangent. Yeah. And uh, Kyle right there, VR should be a supplement, not a substitute. I think that's a wonderfully thoughtful comment. And I wanted to bring up the emulator thing at the end here just because I think it's a good note. Like it's a positive note to end on here. I think uh, some of our people in our audience are a little bit depressed by some of the discussion here at the end. And I want to say that like I think VR is going to help people make a lot more connections, uh, you know, repair some of the things that we maybe lost in the last 20 years of personal computing. But we'll see how that goes. Thank you so much for tuning in. Anything you want to end on here, David? No, no nothing, nothing in particular, just that, yeah, I think the potential of VR is to radically enhance the quality of remote communication, not to replace real life communication. It's, you know, as I've said many times in this show today, hanging out with someone remotely means either looking at a little rectangle of a webcam view of their face or playing a game while hearing them in your ear, but being disembodied. And as you say, the potential of, of being able to feel like you're sitting next to someone while still playing a traditional game or watching a movie means that you can get much, much closer to the feeling of really being with someone in, in real life remotely. But again, that ne that should never come at the cost of completely replacing being in person when you can be. And you know, there was one comment here that said something like, uh, oh, it's from Shell, Alaska. You're not going to get people playing with sticks in the yard again. It's all online from here. There's a lot more to do in the real world than just uh, sticks in the yard. You know, there are sports, there are crafts, there are volunteering. There are all kinds of things you can do in the real world. Um, I don't think either is better than the other. It's just as, as multiple people pointed in the, out in the comments, you need a healthy dose of both. Yep. So much, uh, thank everyone. you so much for tuning in. We will see you next week. I want to make a request uh, on the end here. If someone uh, wants to see the timestamps on the post quicker, please go ahead and make a comment on the video with the timestamps. I'd be happy to pin that if that does appear uh, at the top of the channel. Just save us a little step in getting this podcast out there publicly quicker if someone actually does those timestamps. But thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the incredible discussion, and we will see you in the future. Thanks so much.